Theorize and be damned. Well, hey, hi all. Welcome to the Theorize and Be Damned podcast, the first of our Revol Press podcasts. So Theorize and Be Damned is a podcast that aims to go beyond the text and into the writing process. And I'm very happy to have with me uh, the co-founder of Revol Press and our first writer that we're going to publish, Bram E. Jeebun. So basically, Hello. Revolt Press is uh, hi. Revolt Press is a publisher founded by myself and Dan Malo, who is a writer and immigration lawyer based in the U.S. And you can see you can see here if you're watching us on YouTube, you can see I'm sharing the web page to Revolt www.revoltpress.com, and you can see our first two books here. The, first, the very first being Bram E. Jeebans, The Darkest Timeline, Living in it's, a World with No Future. It is Jeebans, by the way. Jeebans, <laughs> Jeebans, yeah, sorry. Okay. I'm I've sorry always, to correct I've you. Always said, I've always been saying Jeebans, like... um, I've been saying Jeebans for, a, for a couple of years now. Um, okay, so Bram E. Gieben, um <laughs> The Darkest Timeline, Living in a World with No Future. Okay, so we'll be talking to Bram about that today. But let's just speak a little bit about Revol Press. So Dan and I have been speaking for maybe a couple of years, maybe two and a half years about the need to establish perhaps a new author-oriented press. Um, coming out of our experiences publishing before, and what we set up is a press which aims to give authors not only competitive royalties, but fair treatment and shall we say, a good kind of relationship and conversation dedicated to realizing their creative intentions. So it says here on the About page, amongst other things, Revol is here to reassert the creative opposition of the author in solidarity, where once you paid lip service to the revolution and were considered credible, now you can build something revolutionary without compromise. Okay, so... Basically, we've seen a lot of situations also in the art world myself, because I worked, I've worked, i worked a lot um, in contemporary art, where people talk about, about solidarity, they talk about socialism, but maybe the workers in this case, that being the writers, aren't being treated so well. So we aim to kind of turn that around. And our first books include Tony Chamas from, or Tony Chamas, who is, uh, aka One Dime, Bram E. Gibbon, Adam Turl of Locust Review, Dan Malo, who is the co-founder here, who wrote a brilliant book that came out uh, some years ago called Borderlines on uh, immigration. He can explain more at some point. C. Derek Vaughan, you, you may know Derek Vaughan, and myself. Okay, so that's basically Revolt Press, and we have this podcast which we will be running monthly, at least monthly, in which we talk about the process of writing as well as some of the theories coming out of these books. So, uh, Bram, you have a book, um, clearly, um, The Darkest Timeline. So do you want to tell us about a little bit about the thematics, but more for now, just a little bit about how you approached, uh, let's get back to the book cover, how you approached writing that book. Yeah, no problem. I mean, first of all, just to say thank you very much for having me on. And it, it has been an amazing process working with you, Mike, um, you know, working closely on the edits for this. I think I've not just learned a lot, but, you know, developed this text a lot. I'm really proud to be putting it out with Revol. Um, so that's good to get that out of the way. But in terms of the themes, um, I, I think the best way to sum it up is to say that it's about the way the apocalyptic narratives can kind of obscure our very dystopian present. You know, so that subtitle there, living in a world with no future, at points I am arguing or making the point uh, or setting up the, you know, the, the, the evidence for an argument that there's a p potentially very bleak conclusion to things like climate change or technological acceleration. Um, but I'm doing that to kind of clear the decks, I guess, for thinking about what might uh, you know, happen if we engage fully and frankly with the consequences of our dystopian present. And there's a quote that I use very early on in the book, which is kind of attributed to William Gibson. Uh, I go in a little bit into the origins of that quote, I think. But um, he said, you know, the future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. 
And that's that's one of the premises of the book, I would say, is is looking fully and frankly at the ways in which, um, you know, the, the stories we tell ourselves about collapse or about our potential futures or lack of them can get in the way of an understanding of the, the conditions on the ground as they are. Yeah, that, that term collapse is interesting because it's become a kind of commonly used term simply meaning that society is is collapsing or will will collapse imminently um certainly in our lifetimes um and your book engages with that very much with no real recourse for escape i, I think more the point is this is happening then how do we deal with that which is a political stance in a way that the, the, the realization that there's not only we're going to stop it happening or it's going to happen. It's not only like we have to do something to stop this happening. There is, well, it's going to happen, but then how do we countenance that that fact personally and as a community? Um, and I really liked it when, when I first read it because there was just no, there is a kind of, there's no silver lining. There is a kind of, you know, positivity there a couple of times in the book. Um, but, you know, it's not a positivity which in any way gives us a, 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 an escape route. But I just like that, you know, there was no kind of like, well, yeah, but what if, uh, which mm. you kind of get even in capitalist realism, Mark Fisher's uh, famous book, uh, where there's a kind of like, you know, there's, there's no way out of capitalism, but maybe, you know, certain communities might might be able to kind of create a rupture almost accidentally through creative endeavor. That's, that's kind of between the lines what, what, I read, what I would read into it, that the mentally ill, whilst you know, often being made mentally ill by capitalism because of their illnesses, maybe, you know, might be able to think outside, you know, what what appears to be, a, you know, a completely closed situation. Uh, so there's that kind of cryptic, you know, paragraph at the end that suggests something like that, where you don't really have a, a paragraph suggesting or, or any, any segment of your book uh, suggesting anything like that. And I think it's about time we we, we looked at things in those terms. The only book I know that's done that similarly, I mean, no doubt there are several, but the one that comes to mind is Nihil Unbound by Ray Brassier, which is a book about nihilism, which basically, you know, just comes down to, you know, we are doomed, we're going to die, even if it comes down to, you know, some kind of end of the, the heat of the sun, you know, so we're no longer able to survive in, in that sense. Um, I don't remember the exact example he gave. It may have been the sun expanding, or, or there was a scientific example he gave. So, wh however we look at it, you know, way into the future, there's going to be uh, an end. Therefore, we are essentially, you know, as material beings who are anyway, you know, objectively chemically construed, we're already like we're already not existing. We already don't exist, which was pretty bleak. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, anyway, but you, yours is 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 not a metaphysical take like that. It's much more uh, a, a kind of social uh, or political take, but without the actual politics in a sense, uh, in that there's no call for action. Anyway, Dan, any any thoughts from you on that? No, I, I um, Brahma, I remember when when I first picked it up, I was like, wow, yeah, this is this is some bleak stuff because you do you really take the reader um, at the outset and sort of like it reminded me of that that uh, scene in Clockwork Orange where they have his eyes peeled open mm. um, and you just can't look away, and so, um, but like Mike was saying, right as you work through the text um, and sort of just square up on some of the real uh, catastrophes that not just that are facing us, but as you point out, right, are here and now present happening to us, um, just unevenly distributed, uh, that there is a sense, right, that it's like having taken that first step of not closing our eyes or looking away anymore to these things that there are grounds and some fertile grounds um, for evoking change, even within that rather bleak sort of horizon. I think so, potentially, yes. I mean, you know, just to unpack a few things that, you know, you both covered there. Uh, I was very influenced by a couple of, um, you know, kind of the, the, the bleaker end of nihilistic philosophy. Uh, Peter, Peter Schostet Hughes' neo-nihilism is a very central text for me in kind of all of my thinking. Um, but particularly with this book, Thomas Ligotti's The Conspiracy Against the Human Race is, I guess, the even bleaker argument. 
um, you know, about the human condition and about our place in nature. Uh, so I think there are other writers certainly have been in this um, territory. Um, in, in terms of the idea of offering some sort of a program or a way out of these very bleak um, situations that I'm kind of conjuring here, I, I think like that's probably a tendency that I identified when I was researching the book, is that even the best writers on these topics tend to write in the kind of, uh, you know, speculative way, if we do this fast enough, if we can avoid this. Whereas I think a lot of the consequences that they write about, you know, that it, it, they're pretty unavoidable at this point in where we are in, in the current historical timeline. And that's why I framed it as a, a book about a timeline, because I think we are in a particular set of rails and that's what I wanted to write about. So even, you know, and that's maybe something to do as well with like commissioning editors. Everybody wants there to be a positive spin on a negative story. We want there to be a narrative where there is an escape. Um, so I thought it would be interesting to explore the ways that other people have written about that and, and really challenge some of those assumptions within writing about things as if there is a way to solve these problems. Also, I think, you know, two, two of the people that I mentioned uh, very briefly in the book are Jem Bendel and Arne Nice, or Nace, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that. But they both have um, philosophies that are along the lines of deep adaptation. And that's an idea that, you know, of, of like dealing with the realism of severe collapse of particular climate ecosystems and things like that and learning to adapt to living in a world with collapsing populations collapsing societies and uh you know i think even those kinds of narratives are quite solutionizing you know uh that's a horrible word that i've learned from working in business but you know a solution-based thinking is often not the way to encounter the reality of the problem you're trying to solve if you jump to a solution too fast you can often have unintended consequences. And I think like one of the thinkers I like to interrogate in this book is, is Savoy Zizek. In Living in the End Times, he writes about, uh, you know, notions of the imposition of the master, mankind as the master over nature. And he's returned to that theme. And I think at one point advocated, you know, climate hacking solutions, for instance, uh, cloud seeding, carbon capture, as, as things we might need to do in order to you know, mitigate or attempt to solve climate change. And, and those are things that could have disastrous consequences themselves. So that's where I bring in um, John Gray's thinking on that topic. He's very skeptical about the idea that, um, you know, transhumanism and projects like this, which, you know, propose a, a, a technological solution to some of these problems, have a lot in, in common with kind of Christian millenarian myth. Uh, he calls these secular heresies, these narratives of progress. So I think, you know, applying a dose of John Gray's scepticism about progress to the more positive arguments of people like Zizek about our, the possibility we could mitigate collapses of various kinds uh, was an interesting way to counterpose the, the, the findings of very real studies which talk about the vulnerabilities of our societies, our infrastructure, our supply chains, um, which, of course, is something that we've all seen play out in our real lives over the course of the COVID crisis as well. Um, so I think it's hopefully quite a, a, quite a current moment for this type of analysis of, the, of those themes. Yeah, just coming in there, because um, we, we do intend on speaking about the writing process. This is a book you've written whilst working. You, you speak about, you know, a term you just used, um, I, I forget the actual term now, but you said it's a horrible term, but you learned it from business. Uh, I, you, you know, you've been around business, you, you have a job and you don't strictly work in business. I believe you work uh, in, some, in some kind of civil service role um, or something. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in the public sector now, broadly speaking, yeah. Okay, so the point is you work, so you have these things happening, your intensive job, which is, I believe, full-time. You're also a musician. Yeah. You also deal with everything else in life, relationship, wider family, etc. Um, and you've written this book, and you know to read it, it's like, well, this guy, he has a lot on his mind. Apart from knowing that you have a job, and, and, and you know, etc. Um, you know, you, you're dealing with this this pretty bleak stuff. So, um, writing can be tough, but when you're writing something that has no, because often, you know, when you're writing about capitalism, it's like you're writing your way out of a hole. And you imagine some possible outcome, you know, which is which is better than the one you're dealing with. So I, I've written um, 
a few books. The fourth one will be published by Revolt Press in September. They they are all they all deal with uh, the bleakness of reality, um, both you know in a capitalist society, and um, and just um, more more generally uh, you know existentially. Um, but you know somehow you end up you you manifest something. So it's like it's all bleak, but then you're like you you through a kind of um, process of um, how do you call this uh, free association? You end up with some nice little, uh, you know, ending. It's cathartic at least, yeah. So even if you know, even if it's bleak, there's something in there which is which provides an emotional release. And as a reader, you can read it as such, you know, very much like this person's going through something. You don't really get into that. There are some kind of moments of sarcasm, for sure, um, but you. You know, you, you there isn't that aspect. So, I mean, how did you deal with that? How did you feel deal with the writing process? Firstly, um, in in terms of you know around your work, around being a musician, and then you know how did it feel doing that, uh, but not allowing yourself any kind of like you know outlet there. Mm. I mean, well, first of all, I, I would hope that there are a few very very dark jokes in there. <laughs> I certainly attempt to kind of riff on um, a few things like. Um, about the, the, the ideology of Star Trek and things like that. So I hope there's a few kind of punchy bits in there, which if you've got a bleak enough sense of humor, will, will, will at least raise a, a wry smile. Um, no, it's, a very, it's a very entertaining book, but I'm, I'm feeling more about the, emotion, <laughs> the emotional toll of writing it. And then also, because sure. you know, I've written whilst working full time, often sometimes I've written not working, but that's also difficult, um, mm. you know, if you're unemployed um but you know it, it's sometimes hard to get to get down to it if you have these other pressures yeah. yeah i mean you know one of the one of the books of yours that i really love is the meaning of mark fisher and uh that was very much a book that for me was able to engage with the negativity of the foreclosedness of that pronunciation um you know in fisher's book that uh, it's impossible uh, you know it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of the world, uh, end of capitalism so to engage with that central thesis of Fisher, or that certainly what has become one of the motifs of Fisher in, in that process of him becoming memefied, um, which you described so well, th to engage with that is, is almost like a challenge that I can't put down. So in a way that, that thinking was happening in my head already. And, and in terms of how this relates to the music that I make, I mean, I, I've been making uh, music since about 2005, and basically every single theme that I've written about in my lyrics is in this book. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been an attempt to decode all of the concepts, the aesthetics, the crunchy language, uh, the neologisms of things like cyberpunk. That's, that's been very much the central theme of what I've tried to do with hip hop music. Um, and I kind of would always promise myself that one day I would write these things down because um, rap lyrics are, are very quickly gone from the mind. <laughs> I think as well, like a lot of people listen to rap music and um, and, and, and the lyrics are, are largely inconsequential for some people, for maybe a majority of listeners. Um, one of the most best backhanded compliments you can get about a rap song if you're a rapper is I love the production, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, I've had a lot of that. So so putting this stuff down in a book in a, in a format that's readable and permanent and that I can share with people, almost um, helps me out in that I don't necessarily have to unpack the concepts in my lyrics as much. I can say, I've actually written about this. Um, in terms of how I got there, that's a slightly longer story. Um, I do feel with this book that I've found my voice. I've always wanted to write fiction. Um, I've written quite a lot of it, not had a lot of it published, but it's always been a very much a process of tearing myself out of the day job mindset and, and then forcing myself to sit down and write fiction. So it's been very much something I've had to enforce. Um, with this book and the other books I've been writing, it's, it's almost like a layering process where everything I'm reading, everything I'm ingesting, parts of it will end up on the page and then analyzed, you know, sometimes quoted. And so, you know, it took about three years to write this book. It was originally part of a much larger book that's about three times the size and covers several different topics. So when I started working with yourself and Dan, Mike, 
we, you really helped me narrow down the focus of the book, um, how the themes would fit together and help me structure it into something that um, like sang on its own. Do you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, that, that process has kind of developed o over the, over a very long, you know, last couple of years. And uh, now last 12 months or so, I've been, I've been starting to write these essays sort of like each chapter of the book. Those, those seem to be very easy for me to produce pretty regularly. Um, so I've gotten back into the swing of publishing them. I d there was quite a long break where I didn't publish a lot of stuff. I was, I was performing poetry and, and releasing music, but not publishing articles. Um, but this goes back to where I started my career as a writer, which is as a cultural critic. So being able to analyze films and music and philosophy all in the same, um, like, um, literary style that's where i really feel like i found my voice um so yeah I, ho I hope to keep this method going as it were yeah yeah i mean i i totally get that i mean i think it's it is a case of forcing oneself sometimes to get back mm. into the to get back to get back into the writing after the after the day job you have to find hours here and there maybe you block out a couple of evenings one week and then you don't get time for another two weeks um so i mean it, it, it's not the same thing you know as do you have an inheritance and and and, and you write when you want you know and and, and that's mm -hmm. the, that's the situation with with so many uh famous writers historically or they were academics and and part of their job involved them having time to write um so you know i think there's there's a situation now where there's obviously a lot more publishing going on than ever you know online and in print where we're seeing you know many more people able to to publish and and then maybe get an audience but the, you know the audience aspect is is tricky because you feel you, you there's both more people now available um to read books uh and then more ways of finding an audience but then there's just a saturation you know there's mm. just such a saturation of of the market for good and for bad um and that maybe makes things feel a little bit different from from you know from when i started wanting to publish and you know and basically you had a, a few theory publishers academic presses you know fewer who catered to maybe a bigger audience so there weren't that many who did kind of theoretical stuff but for a wider audience um, but you kind of imagine that you 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 would hopefully get with one of these presses, Continuum, um, Routledge, Verso. This was even before Zero Books. You would get with one, and and then you know you were published, and then there would be a response from the experts in your field, and there would be this sense of trepidation. You know, mm -hmm. like how is it going to get received? Because there are all these stories historically of like so and so. You know, their third book was badly received. They almost gave up writing or something. You know, you, you often read this in the, the bio of, of famous philosophers and, and writers, and there's always this thing of the writer and the critic, this kind of, um, this tension. O also because the writer normally is a critic, or the writer of theory is, but then at some point they submit to the critics. And that's partly why we call this um, theorizing. That's very relevant to me this yeah. week, because I've been yeah. emailing, you know, yeah. people who are former journalistic colleagues saying, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you have a I book did. coming out, yeah. But, but you're right that the, 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 the we call so the um, yeah, but we call the the, the the podcast theorize and be damned mm. for that reason. There is this saying, I don't know who it came from originally. It became the name of a of a book fair for a while, publish and be damned. Because yeah. you publish it's out there, it's concretized, and then you're damned because you know it's not gonna live up to even what you intended, mm. then other people are gonna pick it apart. Um, so we changed that to theorize and be damned um because that's the kind of feeling you know you put it out there and, and there's going to be a lot of there's going to be feedback uh of, of positive and negative kinds but how do you feel about that getting getting your work out there well i mean first of all it's it's fulfilling a, a big ambition that i've always had to publish a, a book of my writing um so that's that's the first big thing secondly though i think i'm really excited for critical responses to this even if they're negative in fact, I've really selected a couple of people to try and get to engage with or review the book who I know are, um, you know, like writers who argue against, let's call it the doomer current in thinking about collapse and in thinking about, you know, the future. Um, so I'm, I'm keen to get critical engagement with the book. 
in, in terms of the lay of the land, you know, it is so different. Um, but but then we've lived through, you know, when I first got into writing, it was via the platform blogger. A lot of people got got into writing around about the early two thousands through things like Live Journal. If you look at the way that that's gone now, all the way around to you know platforms like um, Substack and Medium and and Patreon, where you can monetize your writing in different ways. It's it, I mean that's several seismic changes in the publishing model, the way people get paid, the way they reach an audience. And it can be almost baffling because, you know, if you learned 10 years ago how to publish a book, a lot of that information's probably out the window now. So it's opened the space up. But like you say, it was also that signal to noise ratio. You know, that's, that's greatly um, changed um, and, and it's more fragmented. But I think like one of the reasons I started my podcast, which is called Strange, Strange Exiles, for anyone that's not encountered it, is that, you know, I'm, I'm not an academic. I, I have a big pile of books over there and I sometimes sit at my day job and look at that pile of books and wish that I was an academic. But there are certain advantages to being paid to do another kind of writing for my day job and, and read those books in my spare time. And I think like, um, you know, my encounter with theory basically came off the back of um, like personal experiences where I was in a situation with someone who'd read a lot more than me and I wanted to be able to stand on an equal footing with those people for one reason or another. So that's what led me to, you know, go from quite casually reading people like Mark Fisher or a little bit of Baudrillard into engaging with Zizek and then starting to dive a little deeper into more, more classical stuff as I'm continuing to do. Hannah Arendt is my latest obsession. Um, uh, that that's basically something that anybody can do. Um, like Theory Underground, uh, they're, they're another group of you know podcasters, publishers, um, you know online university type deal is what they have going on. And um, you know the, the the thing I like about that, although I, I, I you know that term underground theory, I think that's that's pretty cool. But I, I don't know if it necessarily describes what what you guys are doing here at Revol Press or how I consider myself. I think of myself as like an underground theorist. But the reason I started the podcast was that I think it's possible to encounter incredibly complex ideas and deep systems of thought in the wild and understand them and unpack them. And, and there's kind of um, like a, a trepidation from a lot of people to encounter content that's intellectual. So it, it's definitely important to me to try and write in such a way that not only am I writing in an engaging way, but the ideas I'm introducing people to hopefully are also, you know, it drawing them in to a deeper exploration of those things. And, and that's what I try and do on the podcast. I don't really like, um, it's not an argumentative podcast where I'm saying, well, I'm very left wing and I'm going to argue against this person's point of view. It's more that I invite somebody with it who subscribes to a thought system of one kind or another onto the podcast and then ask them to unpack it and explain it and, Ask them why they ended up thinking like that. So, um, so yeah, that's that's I've, I've written the book in that same spirit of um, trying to provide a little bit of a pop window into maybe a wider area of theory or research or thinking, um, alongside just you know generally what I think about Mad Max and <laughs> <laughs> other other cultural items, you know. Yeah, so I was waiting to see if Dan wanted to come in, but there was that, there was that, there was, that's why there was that unusually long pause for a for podcast. Sorry, I was struggling to come off of mute there. Um, Dan, go on then, yeah. No, um, so, bro, I guess one of the things I wanted to ask to just back up a little bit about um, just the content of the book is what personally draws you to these concepts, right? And um, you talked a little bit about reading Mike's text and, and wanting to explore that here, but what is it about some of the underlying themes, nihilism and, and at all um, that you wrote about here that, that first attracted you? Mm. Well, I mean, actually, I've got to place a lot of blame on a single issue of a DC comic that came out in 1995. Um, that's issue one of The Invisibles by Grant Morrison. And this was a hell of a gateway drug to all of the things that I'm interested in now. Um, I think in the, the the best thing about the com the comic, which is very influenced by bring, things bring like the comic, bring the comic back up, Bram, because oh, we yeah, sure. you on a bigger screen now. There you okay. go. That's the, the comic, Bram. That's issue about. one. 
And this mm. is the first print, so it's worth a few bob. <laughs> uh, yeah, Grant Morrison, art by Steve Yole, DC Comics. But yeah, not only was the comic about things like discordianism and the occult and, you know, cyberpunk and virtual reality and all of these kinds of themes were unpacked in the story. He, he also had a letters page and in that letters page, he would recommend books, um, he would give reading lists and he would respond to readers questions about the themes he was unpacking. So having bought these comics month by month, by the end of it, which was, you know, I think it finished in, the, in 2001. So I'd been reading it since 1995 and it rewired my brain. Um, I would never have read Baudrillard. I would never have um, read The Meme Machine by Susan Blackmore and then gone on to be obsessed with Daniel Dennett and people like that for years. Um, I just don't think I would have found my way to K-Punk and read about Fisher if I had not picked up that issue of the comic. And I remember the day that I picked it up, I went into Deadhead Comics in Edinburgh and I was, you know, 14 and, and obsessed with Batman. And I picked up a big stack of Batman comics and I took them to the front desk and gave them to Gaff, who's the guy that runs Deadhead. And he just went, he just said, um, why are you buying that fucking shit? Buy this. And he put the first issue of the Invisibles in my hand. So I'm pretty sure that this guy changed my life in that respect. And, um, but yeah, I mean, before that, I've always been obsessed with science fiction. Um, you know, read uh, lots of Philip K. Dick and William Gibson grow, uh, growing up and, and was obsessed with particularly cyberpunk. Um, so I think it was probably inevitable that that would be the first thing that I wrote about um, in the, in the, it's something I've thought about since I was, you know, very small. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad I asked because a comic <laughs> book getting us here is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. All respect to Grant Morrison as well. I mean, he's, he's, he's obviously um, written a book about uh, the mythology of superheroes called super gods. That's a terrific book. I mean, so he's, he's engaged in a similar theory of cultural criticism field of cultural criticism as we all are. Uh, as well as being an incredible comics writer. Um, so yeah, they they're, they continue to be a huge inspiration to me and, and certainly were when I was growing up. And I th I'd, I'd like to see them write another book of theory, but about kind of Discordian apocalyptic thought trends. Uh, for, Alan Moore is actually about to publish a book this year as well, which is, is, is his grimoire, which will be his, his account of his magical system fully illustrated so i'm excited to read that i think like wow. the texts that these 80s british wave comic writers are creating as they move out of the industry and into other things are going to be fascinating like textual objects um yeah, even douglas rushkoff you know like that was how i encountered rushkoff was he wrote a comic for vertigo called testament in the in the 1990s which was absolutely tremendous um, so yeah, I definitely blame Vertigo Comics for getting me into weird, weird theory and cyberpunk concepts, you know. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the thematics now. Um, your book covers really a lot of ways in which the world can can go to hell in a handcart. Mm. So um, if you know if one of them doesn't sound entirely convincing, there's another one coming along. Um, they include AI. Um, well, the subjects you cover include AI apocalypse aesthetics the singularity capitalist realism so the, the idea that the world is kind of irretrievably capitalist and we can't change that simulation theory so do we live in a simulation and what would that mean um what we call secular secular heresies so the idea that the secular world has kind of inheritances from from uh, judeo-christianity um and you talk about societal collapse generally and uh quite a lot about ecology as well that doesn't really cover the full breadth of, of, of you know how many dangerous things there are out there that, that you talk about but that's some of the some of the general themes and i've actually been looking quite a lot well i mean i tend to look at this kind of stuff a lot anyway and the world is you know fairly in trouble right now it seems to be just getting worse um all the time um uh, ai is something i i got i got into an ai wormhole actually just yesterday i was really looking a lot but it's something i've been looking at a lot anyway because in my job i'm designing a, a phd writing course where we take into account ai because you just can't teach students writing or teach students you know who you expect to, to, to write essays you know on your course without taking into account um the fact of ai and how that's going to change writing it changing writing is somewhat a concern but i think it might liberate writers 
because it'll be like, well, you know, in terms of generic philosophy books that impress and sell, then AI can do that. Then I can write what I actually want to write, you know, an experiment, experimental theory, philosophy, novel, or, you know, or it just becomes more about process than, than the outcome, you know, because, you know, because you're freed up to think about the process, to be involved in the process, because in terms of the reception, that's less important, or at least it'll be more about, okay, so AI could write this book, but this human being wrote it. So let's talk about to the let's talk to the human being about what that felt like, why they did it. So it, it becomes more and more about the the writing process becomes more and more about what it what it means to to be human and to be human writing. So in a, you know in a sense it hones writing in in a way that the modern period honed the skills of painters because they could no longer you know just be the ones that paint an accurate portrait because photography can do that anyway. So you end up having to deal with you know what can paint do otherwise. So it's an exciting time. So I'm not worried about how it affects writers or my students particularly. I um, think these like paradigm shifts always have costs, right? Mm -hmm. Like so, some people are always going to be left behind by a paradigm shift, and the people who manage to get ahead of it can profit, right? So somebody who learns learns how to incorporate AI into their process and still produces something wonderful is, is going to be ahead of the curve. And I think there was a Chinese science fiction author who. Uh, recently was given a prize and then it was deemed controversial because they'd used AI to produce the book. Um, but that was part of the artistry of the project in much the way that you're describing, Mike. But just to give you two examples, um, I read a book, uh, an article about, um, you know, it, it included the term minimum viable book, right? So there are, if you Google minimum viable book, there are lots of um, guides of like how to write a, a book that will meet the standards to be able to sell on Amazon at volume and, you know, you adapt it to your genre. Um, and there's software that can basically write your book for you from prompts and then you edit it, you know, and it's, and that software is kind of gamified. Some of it's attached to a market uh, where you can actually sell those fictional prompts. They're uploaded to a database where some portion of the copyright is then owned by the large language model. So all of these types of interfaces are like coming for generally creative writing. And the minimum viable book thing, I mean, the reason that that's become popular is there's a huge demand for self-published YA sagas to the point where some of these authors are burnt out because they are trying to produce 12 to 13 books a year. And so they're turning to these models. So, you know, d w will um, AI change the way these things are produced? Yes. Will that be beneficial to some people? Yes. Um, will that mean a less quality art? Yes, but is there much quality in that end of the market anyway? Um, I don't know. And it's, you know, like at the other end of it, like the type of writing that I do professionally, you know, from my day job, that, that whole career will be gone. Like that, that whole section of the industry that's called content design will be wiped out because you'll be able to automate the best, you know, huge parts of that. You'll only need one person working with the large language model. And it's not quite there yet because of, you know, ver various limitations on it. Um, you know, AI hallucinations where they produce false results or fill in the gaps with false data are still a big enough problem that you couldn't use it to write, you know, government documents or something like that. But so it's, you know, we're not quite there yet, but it's gonna, it's gonna fundamentally change things it's going to be about who works with it, but I think I think it will decimate a lot of people whose idea of what it means to write and be a writer is like almost like that seventies auteur theory of cinema, you know, uh, where it's one person yeah. in control. Yeah, I mean, there's that whole aspect. Yeah, and and, and I mean, not that I thought any of that stuff myself. So that's I mean, that's novel and interesting. But what you said, that, but I mean. Yeah, there's that, there's that whole aspect of what it will do to writers, and, mm -hmm. and and you you bring something interesting to that conversation. But you know, I got to thinking, or I've got to thinking recently. You know, what you know what is fairly evident in in the media when you when you when you read about AI. But I've never really taken it very seriously, so I got to thinking about it more more deeply. What might this mean for humanity? Ha having seen how much the internet changed, the internet changed the world. Mm. And, you know, there's a lot of YouTube videos that have this kind of um, clickbait title, or at least, you know, the text in the thumbnail. Several of them from different people say, 2024 is going to get real weird, 
or this is why the, you know things are going to get real real weird real soon so there's this thing of weird and things you know kind of weirding a reality coming about through ai but actually because a lot of these experts are quite conventional kind of not really theorists but you know the super smart guy who is kind of business oriented but but write but writes books on society you know you get all these figures that you know and they get way more viewers than you know our sector of the the online left who get you know 2000 views up to 10000 views a video these days um you know if it's like talking like this these are people who get in the kind of quarter of a million to several million you know they're, they're kind of ted talk type people you know yeah. um there's the diary of a CIO, CEO guy. I don't know if you know him. He has this channel and he brings on these kinds of people all the time. Um, so, you know, in terms of them saying things are going to get real weird real soon, and that's kind of become something of a catchphrase, um, they don't really, they don't really then go into how it's going to get weird. So, you know, because mm. it doesn't, it's not part of their mindset. That's something that Walter Benjamin could have done, for example, mm. but it's not something you rely on these kind of TED Talk type people to do. Um, I was just kind of thinking, what would it mean to get really weird? But then, you know, there's been moments where the internet has made things weird. I can't think of a thing right off the top of my head, but there is, there are certain things that, I mean, when somebody spoofed my book, Meming of Mark Fisher, and these kids on the internet didn't like the fact that I was writing a book about Mark Fisher and memes, because they were meme kids, so there shouldn't be this academic guy writing about this, even if I didn't have a university job at that very point when I wrote that book. So they spoofed the book and they made like a, a book with the same title to try and derail my book. That's like the weirdness of the internet. Mm. That when it's happening to you, it feels really weird. But there's lots of weird moments, you know, which are actually much bigger in, in obviously societal scope. Uh, I don't know if you can think of one, but you know, with AI, just the thing of AI not knowing what hu humans are, you know, so what 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 might AI do when it's yes. just like you know, it's given this like, well, here's humanity, here's the planet, here's you know, how do we solve this? And they're not the AI is not constrained by the bounds of human thought or or what we take to be reason, human reason. So it might just do something really odd. But there's this really dark um, uh, recent case of apparently the targets for guided um, bombs from the Israelis were chosen by AI. So basically AI mm. was going through, yeah. you know, if we find X many of these factors, that would be an enemy combatant. So looks at these kind of websites, knows these kinds of people, is a member of this organization, even if it's not strictly a combatant mm -hmm. organization, enough of these things. And OK, well, you know, that pretty much makes them an enemy combatant. And if we kill 10 other people, there were quotas, the quotas changed. But if we kill 10 innocent people around them, that would be OK collateral damage. So people who maybe aren't actually combatants, you know, then get killed along with their entire family because the quota mm -hmm. is like 10 people. Well, the house isn't going to have more than 10 people in it, so we can just flatten their house. Yeah. You know, this was basically what was happening, and that was all being chosen by AI. So, so already you have a situation yeah. where the tech has outstripped the common human sense. Um, yeah. And that's what happened in World War One with the, you know, with the... Uh, how would you call it mechanized uh, fire machine guns so you because of machine gun fire being able to mow down so many people at once you got into trench warfare so you dig in you wait you send over a wave of men at one, at one time hoping that you know a small percentage get through and then can finish off the enemy with with, with handguns um which actually killed as many as a million people in, in a day in some battles so um absolutely terrifying but when the tech the same with like the dresden bombings for example in world war ii when the tech outstrips, um, you know, our ability to to put the brakes on, you will get these disasters. So what that will mean in terms of AI, I don't know. Um, but you know, obviously, this is this is terrifying. So this is getting into your territory, although you don't quite you don't talk, you don't say that as such. But you know, we're dealing with you know these these kind of end end of the world scenarios, and 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 then if not end of the world, then a prolonged collapse of just a society that is, is no longer, you know, any society as such. I think um, like with AI, yeah, go on, like go on. there's there's no single technology technology that's necessarily like an existential threat to humanity. I think what people don't consider, and it's the same as true of different types of, you know, climate, you know, dangers from climate change, is that these things are all interconnected. You know, so it's about the confluence of these technologies. That's what I wrote about. Um, uh, the, the the book um, uh, Kaleidoscope Century by John Barnes. He writes about um, a, a parallel timeline 
where technologies like AI and certain bioweapons technologies and weapons targeting technologies, much like the algorithms used by the Israelis um, in those attacks, um, or, or sorry, by the Iranians in those attacks, um, all, all of those kind of come together. And um, it, it happens through a technology he calls a simulation modeling optimization targeter, which sounds very much like a description of exactly what you've just described there. It, 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 dis, it, it looks for where it can do the most damage with the least collateral cost. Um, and then that touches on another concept, which I, I look at in the book, which is um, the, the concept of quality adjusted life years or qualies, which comes from effective altruism. William McCaskill came up with this calculation and it's a way about measuring the value of saving a human life based on the quality of that life. And it's, a, it's quite a cold deterministic way of calculating. But that's that's kind of the way that the that a simulation modeling modeling optimized targeter would work. It would use a calculation, something like a quality adjusted life year, perhaps to you know judge um, wh whether the, that collateral damage was acceptable. But what Barnes says is that as soon as you're building systems which analyze systems for vulnerabilities, it's a matter of time until that system, particularly if it's interfacing with humans realizes that humans are basically just another system that can be analyzed and that has vulnerabilities. And as, as Barnes says, I think in the book, humans are just um, a, a, another large language model working on a, a very distributed, massively parallel processor. Um, so it's things like that. It, that, that for me is where um, AI gets interesting because as you say, AI might not understand what we are if you watch the recent Netflix ad ad adaptation of the three body problem, that was quite a good illustration of the kind of dilemma that we face with AI in that they're speaking to these aliens from an advanced species who are coming towards Earth, but we don't share anything conceptually. And so, you know, the, the, the chance that we become enemies is higher. So I think like that's where I wrote about Randonautica. Um, I think it's really interesting to think about something like Randonautica or Pokemon Go, where you're going out into the territory of the real, guided by a but machine. But yeah, mate, mate, can you just give a quick uh, explanation of what Randonautica is for some of the people who, sure. who won't know? So it's a tremendous um, online game uh, that the Joshua Langfelder and his colleagues developed. And what it does is it use, uses some form of, form of quantum number generating, um, you know, uh, te uh, either technology or an algorithm to generate real world coordinates and it sends players to them. And it's generated in a way that is truly random. Um, you can kind of like set the field range of it um, to suit your ability to travel. Uh, and ran random Nautica is basically, you know, anyone can play it. You can log on and play it. It's not like a, like an in a game with an interface. Um, and you report back, you know, lots of people put their accounts on Reddit. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting because people come back with various different stories of things that they've seen. So what was interesting for me about Randonautica though is, is what happens to that data. You know, the, the, we're training our large language models at the moment on the whole internet, the whole open internet. That includes the accounts of people who followed Randonautica coordinates, also generated by machines, and then come back and written an account. So in a w very real way, you could look at, on that as a machine intelligence mapping the territory of the real. And one reason you might want to accurately map what every corner of reality looks like is if you wanted to create what Nick Bostrom in his simulation argument paper calls an ancestor simulation, which would be a complete simulation of our world, you know, pixel for pixel, detail for detail, but focused on one player um, or a group of players so lots of people have written about this idea of an ancestor simulation bostrom wasn't the first person to pick it up but his innovation was talking about the basement level and the fact that you can't know if you've gotten out of the basement level um so random Nautica makes us ask questions about the kind of limits of the processing power of the simulation that we might be in if random Nautica sends you to you know a liminal place that's very empty you might wonder if this is like a section of the game that you're not meant to be in, but you've kind of no clip through a wall. Um, so I think that's really interesting. I, I think we don't know how we're reacting with interacting with machine intelligences. I think it would be fair to say we don't know if we're interacting with machine intelligences. Um, 
would we be able to tell if there was some sort of threshold crossed? A lot of the futurists, you know, who you talked about, Mike, they, they do have this motivational speaker way of looking at things. They're usually positivists. Ray Kurzweil, who's, you know, one of the, the great fathers. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know them as the futurists. You, you mean when I'm talking about these kind of TED Talk type people? Yeah, but like Ray Kurzweil, for instance, you know, he's one of the first people to think about AI. And he's, you know, the guy who, who, who originated the idea of the technological singularity. They, they had him on Joe Rogan recently. And Kurzweil is like confidently predicting you know, um, conscious AI, uh, you know, again, the technological singularity, infinite data storage and capacity, you know, batteries that never end, infinite energy, all within 20, 30 years. And he, and he says he can prove it with maths. And, um, and then you send him up against Joe Rogan, who's you know, got a conspiratorial mindset. And he's saying, yeah, but you know, what about Terminators? <laughs> and I've never heard so much dead air in a podcast. Like I couldn't tell if Kurzweil just wasn't open to challenges that gave a negative reading of AI, or if he just thought Rogan was colossally stupid, or some combination of both. But it's a fascinating listen. And eventually Rogan does get him to admit that were a rogue AI situation to emerge, that that would be catastrophic for humanity. But Kurzweil, while, while he concedes this, doesn't then build this into his predictions. So I think it is, I think there is a sales pitch there whenever people are talking about things like AI or currently space travel, which is a lot less of an idealistic and much more of a business oriented proposal than it used to be. All of the, these things are, are very contaminated by this like real faith in progress. Um, but progress rests on the stability of the, the civilization that's progressing. And, and I don't know how stable our systems are. There's a lot of evidence they're not stable. Yeah, I mean, I always took futurists to be the Italian, you know, avant-garde artists. But yeah, I guess this term is is it's come around again. Um, I mean, I find this thing of uh, how do you call it, simulation theory, really interesting. And I think that what your book does, it's kind of like putting us in a very uncertain kind of um, in a kind of hinterland or in a kind of you know, in a, in, a, in a liminal space, we we don't know where we are. We, you do talk about the back rooms, this kind of mm. uh, meme fad for images of um, kind of nowhere, you know, spaces that look a bit like dank warehouses. And there's a whole kind of history about how the, 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 the back rooms emerge. Maybe you can tell us in, in a minute more about that. Um but you know that's a kind of liminal space, a nowhere space where something is maybe going to happen that's not good, but you know it's not happening right now. And that's, I mean, if you're not in a situation of of the worst case scenario happening to you right now, that's where you are. You're in that kind of like you know, there's some kind of there's something maybe going to happen. And in this simulation theory, it's, there's that kind of um, uncertainty of like, are we a simulation? Then of course, if you're a simulation. You know, you, you, there is a kind of an instability to reality, not just a thing of like, I don't know how, in, in, you know, how good my health is. How long am I going to hold out physically as an individual, you know, in the world? Um, you know, we all, we all think that even when we're healthy, even when you've had a checkup from the doctor, you know, if you're kind of a hypochondriac. Um, and I guess a lot of us, you know, have that kind of, we, we lean towards that these days because, you know, because we, it's just such an anxious society. So you're always kind of like, you know, you, you always have that basic anxiety about your own mortality. But if you're in a simulation, it's like, couldn't they just turn off the switch? Or, you know, you, you don't know how stable reality is. Of course, anyway, even if we're not in a simulation, we don't know if the university, if the university, <laughs> the university could implode suddenly. Or the universe <laughs> is what I mean. There's a good Freudian slip. Um, <laughs> but, um, okay, I never know when I'm teaching if the university is going to implode suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that's just a normal thing. But we, if if it was a simulation, it's even more the case. Mm. Um, so you know, this simulation thing it, it makes one feel a bit even more even more insecure because we don't know why we're here unless you have real relig religiosity. You don't know why you're here, then you don't even know if you're like the original. And really, honestly, I can't see how we can be the original because if you look at the, the way that we are surely going to get the tech to well it seems like this could happen that we could download people onto computers or whatever or at least make other sentient beings um that that derive you know from from computer tech 
Um, if we're already getting to that being on the horizon, and if we don't get wiped out before that happens, then then it must have already happened. So, you know, yeah. that really makes you feel, well, you already don't know why you're here, but it's just got way more complicated, you know? Yeah, that's the broad thrust of Bostrom's paper, is that it, you, because it's because it's not provable that we're not in a simulation, then it's more likely that we are, is the broad thrust of the paper. And it's, a, you know, like all of his papers, it's a provocation. It's not, it's not proof, it's a provocation. Um, you know, he's almost like a satirical writer, I think. Um, in some ways, and I think that's fascinating. But you know, we, we have lots of narratives before his argument about questioning one's own reality. Um, you know, that's why I pick on, on on Philip K. Dick in particular. I think he's kind of like the uh, you know the, the the patron saint of the is reality real story. Um, so yeah, I think that's you know the 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 question that Bostrom poses is how can you prove when you wake up from one reality into another? That you've reached the basement level and i think the answer is you can't but you can also look at what happens when people perceive that they are in um you know a simulation or you know you could describe a simulation as a false consciousness something some set of values some set of beliefs that you've assumed that can become a moment of epiphany or revelation um in philip k dick books in films like the matrix what does that look like it's some sort of glitch you know it's some sort of glitch in reality that tells you this is a little bit off, that person's a doppelganger, that this room isn't the room that I'm in. Um, one of the best liminal books is House of Leaves by Mark Danielewski. And he uses the actual text of the book to get you lost in the space that he's describing, these impossible geographies of a, uh, you know, a kind of haunted basement world. So I think these are, you know, the, it, also, you know, liminality, like liminal spaces, the back rooms, that's an enormously popular vibe at the moment on the internet. I'm in a Facebook group called Liminal Spaces. There's just pictures of liminal spaces, uh, 620,000 members. And like, if I look at even the first couple of images scrolling down on that group today, they've got the floods in Dubai, you know, and uh, the way the shot's taken is kind of misty. All the cars have sunk beneath the waves, but it still looks like a desert night. Uh, you know, it's kind of washed out tones as well as having everything submerged. It looks wrong, but it also looks peaceful. Um, that's an image of climate collapse. That's an image of the world being broken. So I think there's a way that liminal vibes speak to the space that we all live in. Is there's something as well about the way that like a particularly an empty space like you know people are obsessed with urban exploration and abandoned buildings the liminality of those spaces i think a lot of people find like comforting because it's almost like you can imagine yourself as the last man while standing in a collapsed you know piece of infrastructure an old shopping mall an old pool so yeah i'm absolutely obsessed with those things and and, and the back rooms itself started i think on you know on the meme boards on on 4chan i believe and then you know, move to Reddit. It, it's akin to a creepy pasta, in that it's a kind of collective mythology. Uh, people have based video games, books on it. The most famous video is um, the back rooms found footage by King Pixels, and he's turned that into a whole series of videos. Um, but the basic, you should you should watch the video. Really, it's hard to describe, but effectively, it, it's first person, so you are the camera. You're walking down a series of endless, impossible hallways with nothing in them, but something is following you. Um, so he really nails that liminal vibe. And uh, I think, you know, it's really hard to tell how much of it's computer generated and how much of it's location shot. So it's cleverly made. So there's something there of Kane Pixels creating a simulation, creating a liminal space where people are going to inhabit that story of the back rooms. Um, which is told in fragments and is meant to make you doubt your own reality. Yeah. So that when you end up standing in a liminal space, like for instance, if you've booked yourself in to a travel lodge in Birmingham and are trying to find your room, you're gonna be looking over your shoulder from the creatures from the back rooms. You know? Yeah, I, I'll say I, I, um, I read through that chapter and was reading was like, I have to know what this is about. So I went and watched I don't even think I made it five seconds in and I was like, this is terrifying. Right. And it does, yeah. it is so convincing that I walked away with that very experience that you're describing. Right. If like you do 
question, right? Like mm. whether or not you are in fact where you think you are, um, even after leaving that. And I think that's a really profound moment um, that just sort of like unite some themes here. It's like draw the book draws upon this experience outside of the book that if you do partake in it and come back to the text, you now have a more expansive um, experience, a completely different experience, I think, in reading the text and working through it. Um, if okay, I can pivot sure. you a little bit on like empty spaces, though, mm. uh, can you talk a little bit about process. If you ran into writer's block while you were, or what's commonly called writer's block, um, you know, just sort of that empty feeling um, when facing the page and how you dealt with it. Interestingly enough, you know, as I touched on before, uh, uh, this, this writing was a new process and a new approach to writing. That's what resulted in these essays. Um, and that itself was a solution to writer's block. Um, I was very, very blocked for a couple of years. Um, could, had nothing to draw from the well when it came to fiction. Um, I'd also spent maybe eight years just throwing my best thoughts at the algorithm. I don't know. I, I was one of these people who was incredibly suckered into the narcissistic performance of the self on social media. Um, and not only was I drawn to it and sucked into it and, and did it not only did it become a proxy for real life, for friendships, um, it also cost me a great deal. It involved me in situations where because there was like a lack of, uh, like a, a question of a loss of face involved, um, I reacted in ways that I would never react if it was a proper relationship and not a simulated one online. So part of this was that, you know, when I read something, I, I quite often have the urge to take the interesting bit and then play with it a bit. And I was just doing this online. And uh, I think I just decided that I was giving too much of myself to the algorithm, that this wasn't a good place to put this. Um, and I needed to get off social media because <laughs> I'd made a fucking mess of things in various ways. So I, I, I kind of withdrew from social media for a very long time. And I, and I took all of my posts off Facebook. I put them in a big spreadsheet. Everything that was over three to 400 words, I put in a big document and I started writing from there. So that was the original source document was like eight years of Facebook posts, a lot of which were about Hey guys, we're all fucked. World's ending. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't think any of them survive at all, word for word, in their original form. But a lot of the jumping off points for the for the essays were from things I maybe posted on Facebook between about two thousand and eight and two thousand and sixteen. Um, and I guess I'm I'm curious. Um offhand if you know of any portion that did survive in its original writing and to to what extent um you feel that you've changed as a writer between writing all of that those loose fragmented i guess to, to for lack of better terminology and now I, I honestly feel like i've kind of learned to write all over again um you know obviously this approach that i'm taking combines a few things that i already did the subject matter of, of my music, um, the kind of uh, critical analysis from, from journalism and, and that analysis of different types of pop culture in particular. Um, and then, you know, academic writing, like I, I, I do have a, a bachelor's in English and a, and a master's in creative writing. So I've written critical essays my whole life. And I think, you know, I've, I've actually got to credit the, the Glasgow creative writing course uh, we read a lot of very experimental nonfiction writing as part of that creative writing course. And while that didn't at the time resonate with me, the stack of books that I took away from it did later, you know? So I think, you know, it's, 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 it's a synthesis of other types of writing that I've done before. Um, but I feel, I feel very indebted to Mark Fisher. I read K-Punk from a very early age that I think, I think that the, that for my generation, and maybe some younger people as well. He kind of reinvented what criticism could be for better or worse. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, he has, you know, there are precedents, like he didn't invent the way K-Punk feels stylistically um, from out of thin air. Um, but to me, he's a figure almost a little like John Peel. Um, you know, John Peel was very influential to me as I was growing up in terms of getting me into particular types of music. 
and and people like um mark fisher in particular i think were good at curating culture and ideas and making it feel important and significant and and making it feel like it mattered you know i think even as well like it, fisher probably owes a lot to the writers of things like the enemy and melody maker in the 80s and 90s there were some incredible journalists i mean you know simon simon um is it simon reynolds the name escapes me just now retromania um, yeah simon reynolds i believe but just ju one thing john yeah. peel he might not be known uh stateside or indeed in many other places uh john john peel who's huge in the uk and i'm sure is, is known by people intensely into music in, in many other countries um was basically a, a bbc radio host who had a regular show where he would basically just trawl through all these tapes people sent in and he would play band demos from bands that were completely unknown alongside music by much better known people and it's that thing that he did that he was like you used to talk about a curator of of culture but you know of, of um of unknowns as well as, as well as known people mm. um a bit like i mean you talked about theory underground earlier this 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 thing they did where they brought out a book which has you know zizek in but it has people who were you yes. know complete unknowns in, in the theory world and it's of course of course what we aspire to do in a, in a different way mm. um but you know we we want to give a foot up to some people who are, are relatively unknown in the theory field if i can say yourself you know you're not Definitely. you know you're not yeah. known as a theorist as such um but also some people who are, who are a bit better known and we want to get into some quite experimental writing as well but yes john peel brilliant at, at doing that and and he became a reference point for the whole country anybody into alternative music shall we say and it could be you know it could be like it could be like some kind of psychedelic sounding thing it could be something more what we end up calling grungy but it could be even some kind of far out metal or you know or folk or whatever he became a reference point for the whole country to you know to listen to that yeah. show and see what was going on and I just fisher was somebody who to his show like in the 90s and it was like it was like um it, you know, it's, it's hard to describe now to people who have so much access to all of the culture in the world instantly at their fingertips, how normal and bland the world felt before that was all available. And so when someone like John Peel was on the radio on a Sunday night, that was like beaming directly into your brain, stuff that was like, this is you, this is, this is what you're all about. Yeah, um, and Fisher yeah. did that to some degree in his in his music writing that he he yeah. kind of raised up some obscure some obscure stuff, but also he would just uh, you know he he wrote a a, a a dialogue with me that we published in Freeze magazine, but then Freeze redid their website and lost like a whole lot of stuff, but I still had the text. It's now actually on Revolt Press's uh, Patreon. But I was an unknown, but I was like, will you write this, you know, will you have a dialogue with me? He was like, yeah, sure. So, you know, that was his thing. So many people in the theory realm are like, no, you stay down there. You know, you're not, mm. you, you can't talk to me. Even when they're like on the podcast and the YouTube and they're like, hey, yeah, I'm really open and cool. But they're only wanting to appeal to, you know, to the successful people, to the cool people. That happens too much. And we know that there are channels that that doesn't happen with. So um, you, we mentioned already Theory Underground, but the um uh, this is revolution yeah, who i think are a great channel that involve yeah. a really diverse group of people so there are there are a few good people i mean i always I, I reach out to people like matt mcmanus really sound guy i wanted some advice on publishing something um recently i was like well, how do i go about this how do i present it to the publisher because you know at revol we encourage and i publish with revol but i'm also going to publish it elsewhere we're in country we encourage people to go elsewhere and Matt McMahon has had the time to go through, like, this is what I would do, this is how I would approach them. And, you know, you do get that from a certain amount of people. And and actually, of course, I mean, that tendency, a, a kind of, uh, I mean, whatever our social class backgrounds are, but should we say working class, because we're working, you know, a, a working class um, tendency in theory where we all help each other out. Of course, that's happening more now I, I would say than it was happening before because of the internet, you know, but then of course you have this opposite tendency where people are deeply caught up in the debate culture and people are canceling each other. So you have these two tendencies, but we tried to grow out of this and maybe take a step back a little bit from the online because we don't want to, you know, we don't want to 
deliberately start debates, deliberately start controversies to get attention. We want to go back to the to the, to the dialogue um, and to supporting writers in writing. You know, because they don't we don't have to be on Twitter on Twitter twenty four seven. You know. Uh, we don't want this feeling that, yeah, yeah, now we published you, get out and do 100 podcasts. However, you know, that is probably how you're going to, that is how you're going to get, get your story across, get, get, maybe, convey to the world that you yeah. have a book. But that's, that's a sad reality. But we're not all, we're not all about that. Um, I'd maybe put it like this, you know, one of the reasons that I took this stuff off of social media and started to think about it more and unpack it. I want the provocation to be in the book. That's what I want people to respond to. I don't really give a fuck about getting involved in debates on Twitter. Um, I find it, I find it not a profitable use of time that leads anywhere, but taking your ideas and refining them and putting them out there and letting people respond to them. That, that to me feels like a productive way to do things. So yeah, that's certainly my involvement with it. You know, I mean, I, I think we're all about trying to get back to the conversation and, 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 and giving writers time to develop their writing, talking to them about it. So, you know, we won't have like, you know, one editorial chat. We'll keep speaking to you if you want that. Um, what then happens in terms of us not wanting to, to court so much the social media attention? I don't know because I don't know what it, you know, what it was going to feel like if we turn around and no one's looking at us. So, you know, this is a contradiction, but you know, can can one afford to lose? Can one afford to lose the attention if the prize is that you get you get to you know focus on the process, focus on the development of your thought? Um, hopefully, that's enough in itself. Although you know, we want to support the writers in, in in reaching an audience, of course, as well. So you know, it's it's something that we have to work out as we go along, really. You know. Uh, and you're, you know, obviously our first writer, but you know, I'm really happy with the book, the book we have, which incidentally is going to print now. Well, it, it will be available in on June 28th. Um, it will be available for pre-order. Well, it's available for pre-order already, as you can see on our website. You can pre-order it from there. Um, but it will get to you just after June 28th, or we, we'll probably ship it just before. It will get to you around then, and it will be available from other major websites very soon. Um, uh, I mean, I think we, we need to, maybe we need to wrap up with something. What, what's this really been about? We will play out with a recording from Bram of him, um, giving a reading and, we, and that will be a reading. Uh, we have a couple of readings. Uh, we'll give another one to maybe to our Patreon or supporters, or maybe Bram will, will be able to use it. But for now, as we've been talking, uh, so much, we're going to rec we're going to play just one of Bram's recordings, and it is. Uh, let me think. Uh, all my notes are somewhat in a mess. Um, it is. <laughs> Bram, you have to wait a minute. The Matrix Sim Theory, you've called it, which is from the Game of Drones chapter, chapter five of that book. So um, let's wrap up saying, again, that book's out on June 28th. We are a publisher which aims to support our writers and give them very competitive royalties. And not only that, we give them 5% of every other book. So that is, well, very good royalties already. Let's not go into our specifics right now. Um, but we know that they're, they're better than our competitors, plus 5% of the royalties off every other book that's being published. So that makes it very much a collective endeavor in that sense. Me and Dan are very much at the forefront, uh, but you know, it's collective in, in, at least in that regard. And of course we have a, a number of readers that um, will be reading the books as well in time uh, as we get fully into the process. Let's have a look at that. Our readers include Daniel Mailer, who is here myself, Parvez Alam, a brilliant Bangladeshi writer who is studying a PhD in Amsterdam, who writes a lot about Mark Fisher in relation to Sufism. David Blacker, a professor who's written a brilliant book on uh, Marxism and education, but also more recently on psychedelics coming out, uh, psychedelics and education coming out from SUNY later in the year. Patricia Correa Rico, who is a theorist and a medical uh, i think nurse in portugal and a phd candidate at the university of evora emma stam 
who is at um, SUNY University, and she does a lot around psychedelics. Ernesto Vargas is uh, a theorist and analyst in uh, Mexico, so analyst, psychoanalyst type um, therapist. Um, so those people are also involved. So it has that sense of collectivity as well. And um, we've been really happy to have Bram here as our very first guest and our first writer. Bram, do you want to tell people what we're playing out with or just talk us through what we're about to hear? It's a reading from chapter five. Absolutely. So, yeah, um, this is from the chapter called Game of Drones. Um, and, and it's a little bit about drone warfare and drone technology at the start of that chapter. But by this point, we're into the concept of, you know, the human as drone, the human as the player within the reality that's been simulated. So we're going to unpack um, a few concepts for, from Nick Bostrom and then dive into the kind of enduring cultural uh, symbolism of the matrix a little bit. Um, let, let's get matrix pilled together. The 99 cyberpunk film, The Matrix, is the source text of the discourse about simulation and awakening in our current era. Derived from the aesthetics and subject matter of William Gibson's Neuromancer, its influence and importance as a symbolic system is evident in the appropriation of the original film's red pill, blue pill allegory by the men's rights movements. So-called incels refer to their radicalization as being black-pilled. Inevitably, the suffix pilled can now be applied across any political axis. It's simply shorthand for the idea of illumination, of waking from illusion. As with many metaphors, the synonym implies the antonym. To take a pill from any ideology is to wake up into a new reality based on new assumptions and limitations. From the point of view of such an awakening, the reality on the other side of the glass is the false one. There can never be a synthesis of the two. It's telling that the matrix involves a narrative that pits agents against subjects. The agents are programs intended to enforce compliance with the false reality. The subjects are the enslaved, disembodied consciousnesses of the real protagonists. The implication here is that to awaken is to find agency, to become an agent, to escape the prison of the subject. Behind this is the implication that once awakened, we will find kindred souls. Perhaps this is the secret of the matrix as a persistent cultural symbol. We are all surveilled and pursued by agents. We are all the sleeper who must awaken. Awakening always carries the charge of a religious epiphany. In 1974, the science fiction writer Philip K. Dick experienced a vision in which a whole belief system, an alternative history of the world, alternative history of the world was revealed to him, along with a new understanding of time. In Dick's visions and their accompanying theology, which is unpacked in his posthumously published Exegesis, the Roman Empire never ended. Our time was merely a hallucinatory pseudo-reality, a simulation designed to ensure control by hegemonic Roman powers. Dick became aware of a protective entity or entities that take our side against this domination. The consciousness he came to describe as Valis, the vast active living intelligence system. His devotion to decoding and explaining, uh, his devotion to decoding and explaining this epiphany, which included a new understanding of Christian theology, occupied Dick until his death. The complexity and absurdity of his theological system serve only to conceal its utility as one among many meticulous clockwork allegories for coercion and social control in the author's canon. Another signifier of whose real is the true reality. His own obsession with the reality of and evidence for this system is like Jean Guerrero's father's descent into the real of conspiracy community. It's not a fiction or an allegory to the subject. The simulation, the shared delusion is experienced as reality itself. This is an echo of the definition William Gibson would give for cyberspace, a term he also coined. In an off-sighted passage from Neuromancer, he described the liminal space we occupy online as a, as a consensual hallucination. Like Dick, in the world of the Matrix, Neo awakens into a world with a new historicism, a new timeline. 
chosen from the unreal prison reality as a subject with the power to escape, to awaken from it. He is the subject to whom agency is revealed, both as enforced control, in the form of the agents who come to eliminate him to prevent his awakening, and liberating control through the revelation that he has agency and can control his destiny, uh, as in the part where he says, I know Kung Fu. <clears throat> the allegory at play in the Matrix implies that Neo has at this point reached the reality beyond the simulation when he awakens in the Nebuchadnezzar, the base craft used by the film's characters. But within this reality, he's still framed as the hero, the archetype, the chosen one. The revealed system, the city of Babylon, the war with the machines, offers no more empirical evidence of its objective truth than the simulation itself. If there were a science fiction film capable of representing the real of ideology in action, the true bleak and brutal reality of capitalist exploitation and imperial extractivism, it would not be found in the simplistic imagery of the Matrix with its H.R. Geiger-esque egg sac battery farm containers. This is just another shallow visual metaphor that asks you to awaken from one capitalist hero story into another. Such a film might bear closer resemblance to 2013's bleak Russian take on the genre Hard to Be a God, in which scientific members of a spacefaring Earth culture become involved in the horror of another planet's feudal conflicts. Both interference and non-interference in this feudal culture, their attempts to influence and improve it, and their submission to it, their exploitation of it, all reach the same terminus, piles of corpses. In the film's schema, there would have been no possible way to awaken the medieval subjects of the backwards planet. The so-called advances of the Earthers' technological society reflect the same inequalities, the same methods of coercion and control. Whether the participants are awakened or not is immaterial. In most cases, both sides will assume that they are awakened, while the other side is deceived. Whichever version wins out as truth, and whichever is deemed heresy, the victors nearly always triumph in bloodshed, chaos and destruction. The reality to which one awakens, or from which one wishes to awaken, is the reality of the victor. The African proverb about lions and historians, popularised in the 1990s by the poet and novelist Chinua Achebe, forever holds true. Until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. In other words, to wish for awakening is to dream of alternate realities, to create within oneself a simulation. To awaken does not guarantee that we, we have reached... Uh, to awaken does not guarantee that we have not entered another simulation, another false consciousness. This much is implied by Nick Bostrom's simulation argument paper, first published online in 2001, two years after the original Matrix movie dominated the summer box office. Bostrom writes that our inability to perceive whether or not we live in an ancestor simulation implies the existence of a basement level of reality the final reality beneath all the layers of nested simulations where the first ancestor simulation was created. Just as any political, personal or spiritual awakening seems to reveal to us a pre-existing pattern or truth, the awakening from one level of a simulation into another does not prove that one has reached the basement. None of our political realities have any more solid ground than these simulated levels of a Bostrom reality stack. In just the same way, we cannot prove the reality or unreality of our subjective experience by codifying it. If our lives are shaped by ideologies, then we must be able to traverse them, to move between them. Otherwise, the argument is simply one of whose subjective reality is the most real, with no proof possible.